things that I learned in this process are almost immeasurable. Like I, there's so many that it's so easy for me to lose track. It's funny because my pastor put me on the spot um, on this past Sunday and had me had me to give the testimony um, about purchasing my home and literally. When I got like when I got back to my seat, I was like, oh wait, I forgot to say this, 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 that, 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 that. Like I forgot to say so many things. And the reason why is because there were so many lessons and so many turning points and pivots in the process. Um, that some of the things I had honestly forgotten. Even this morning, when I was trying to kind of narrow down, you know, the points that I wanted to focus on for this morning's broadcast, um, it was hard. So literally what I did, I was like, you know what, let me try not to narrow anything down I'm just literally going to go back to the beginning and I went back to the beginning and kind of pulled the first three lessons that I learned in this process which again it's so there's so many lessons so many levels to this so um we are going to go ahead uh, and pray in. Um, for those of you who are joining, I see a lot of new people. So for those of you who are joining who do not know me, my name is Tiffany Gillespie and I am a small business consultant based out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I am coming to you live today from my brand new basement in my brand new home. Uh, that's why it's so dark and all of those things down here. But I promise by next Tuesday, we will have it all together if you guys will come back and join us. I specialize in helping Christian leaders to turn their ideas to reality and to take their uh, struggling businesses and turn them into thriving six-figure brands through the use of systems, strategies, and strategic events. Thank you all so much for all of the congratulations and all of the love that you have shared um, regarding this uh, wonderful accomplishment. And we give all glory to God um, this morning and every morning. I am going to go ahead and pray us in. Um, and once again, please take this opportunity before we get started to invite someone to join us and then we're going to hop right into what we want to talk about today. God, before we come to you asking you for anything, we first just want to thank you for everything. God, we want to thank you for waking us up this morning. We want to thank you for waking us up in our right minds, Father God. Lord, we want to thank you for your favor, your grace, and your mercy that meets us and overtakes us every single day. God, we thank you for your eternal truth. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for what it is that you build in us as you work through us. Father God, I pray that you would have your way this morning, that you would open the heart, mind, and spirit of every person who is watching this broadcast, and that you would allow them to see you through what we talk about this morning. Father God, use me as your vessel. Allow me to only speak those things that you would have me to say. I pray these and all things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Yes. The first slide from the new home. Amen. Um, all right. So one of the things, so I was, like I said, I was preparing the notes this morning and this morning we are talking about the promise producing process. If you know anyone in your life who is going through a process that is really trying them and they've been texting you and calling you and crying and oh my gosh, woe is me. It's so hard. It's so tough. Don't be selfish. You need to invite them to this broadcast. And if it's you, then re invite yourself to the broadcast, okay? Because uh, we want to make sure that you get that this morning. But we're talking about what the process produces, the promises that it does produce. And as I was thinking uh, about it, as I was kind of getting my notes together this morning, um, I thought about Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. And guess what, guys? I did pack my Bible somewhere where I could access it. I went straight to it this morning. I said, I know where my Bible is and I know where my notebook is. Those were two things I didn't have to look for. I had to look for my drawer but I didn't have to look for my Bible. Um, so this morning, though, we're going to flip right into uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 3. And I, I want to point out something here. If you're reading in the NIV version, you're going to see that uh, the kind of subtitle for this particular part of the Bible is called peace and joy, right? Peace and joy. Peace is something that I literally had to pray for the entire process. And to be honest, it's something that I pray for every single day, you know, that um, God would grant me his peace that truly surpasses all understanding that in the midst, no matter what's going Going on because as a leader on a daily basis you are going to face various challenges that will 
try to upset your peace. I was having a conversation with someone uh, who's very close to me yesterday, and we were talking about this thing concerning peace that no matter what kind of process you're going through, that if you feel like you are being tried on every side, right, no matter which way you go, no matter which direction you go in, you need peace to sustain you. You need peace to overtake you. And that's what God's peace is. His word says that he will get, uh, grant us peace that truly surpasses all understanding, which means that it's not going to make sense to your logical mind, but in your spirit, you're going to feel this peace that is unlike anything that you ever could have done for yourself. And then the part about joy. Joy is not dependent on circumstances. Joy is not dependent on what's happening around you. That is happiness. Happiness is an emotion and it is something that changes based on different situations. Sometimes you can be really happy. Sometimes you're not so happy. Sometimes you might not be happy at all with the, the way that things are going. But no matter how something may be going, you want to make sure that your joy is intact and joy is between you and God. It is a uh, vertical relationship and you should never allow anything that is horizontal, none of the things that are on earth, none of the things that are happening in your relationship, you should never allow any of those things to come in and cut off the vertical connection, this one-on-one -on -one connection that you have with God that says, no matter what's happening around me, I'm going to hold on to my joy. I'm going to believe you, God, keep my focus on you so that these trivial things that are here on my level do not distract me from the joy that you are trying to give me from a heavenly place. So that was a tangent. Y'all know I tend to have one every broadcast, but let's look at Romans chapter five, verse uh, three. And in the NIV, it reads, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. One of the things, uh, as I was going through this process that I had to study was the word rejoice. And rejoice means to find joy in, to celebrate with, right? That we are finding joy in God. We are finding joy in our relationship with him. We are finding joy in the process that we are literally going through the process of rediscovering the joy that is already there. And it's not the fact that there is not joy to be found in the situation. You as the individual have to go through the process of rediscovering it and being able to celebrate with other people. So what this word is saying is that we should find joy in our sufferings. That when we look at the things that are causing us pain, the things that don't feel good, the things that try to be a distraction, the things that may hurt a little bit, that when we look at those things, we should be able to find joy in it. And the reason why is because as children of God, we know the truth. We know that God's eternal truth and eternal reality is much bigger and much higher than what's happening on this level, on this earthly level, right? So it says, we also rejoice in our sufferings. We find joy when we're going through hard times. If you know that you're somebody who finds joy when you are going through a rough time, I need you to hit the like button, the love button, something. This is the way that you need to change your perspective into, um, who's that? Uh, life just for living. It is very hard to accept, but this is true. God's word is eternal and it's true that I have gotten to the point, and this took a perspective shift, right? A change in the way that you view things and a change in the way that you view the situations that are happening around you, right? That if you can focus your, your, your attention on what is eternal and what is forever, you will not get caught up in these things that are just kind of passing through your life, right? I'm not going to latch onto something and allow my emotions to become attached to something that is just passing through my life. It's literally moving. If I stay steadfast, which means means that you stay firm. If I stay steadfast, that thing is going to move before I do. And this is a perspective shift that I developed, honestly, when I lost my job, right? The first time, because y'all know I lost my job twice in one year. So when I lost my job the first time, I knew that God was trying to strengthen my faith and trying to show me a different way of looking at things. And one of the biggest lessons that I took from that and that I share with people all the time, whenever they're facing some sort of obstacle, especially when it's dealing with other people, is that God will move them before he moves you. What that means is that if you just remain 
steadfast. That thing is going to keep on the same way it floated into your life is the same way it's going to float right on out of your life. And you have to have that kind of mindset, that type of belief, that kind of perspective that the same way this little demonic distraction creeped on up into my life, it walked on to the scene, is the same way that it's going to walk itself on out of here. God's word said that we have the power and the ability to speak to a mountain and it will grow feet and throw itself into the mountain. You guys have heard me talk about that particular scripture a lot. It's in Matthew, right? That when, when we speak to something, when we speak to an obstacle and say, you have to be moved, when you continue to speak to it and speak God's truth to it, that situation will grow its own legs and its own feet. You don't have to worry about doing so much fighting and toilsome work if you just focus on speaking God's word to the situation. If you focus on speaking God's word and his truth to what's going on and to what's happening around you. So literally you can say depression, you have to move. Distraction, you have to move. Confusion, you have to move. Health issue, you have to move. Whatever your challenge is that you can speak to it and that thing will grow its own set of feet and walk right on out of your life the same way that it strolled on up in there. Okay. So Going back to our text, this is why we should find joy in suffering because you should, let me tell you something, when you have been through enough in your life and when you have tried God enough and he has proven himself to you, God has a proven track record with you. Although you may say, you know what, Tiffany, I don't see it. It's not in front of me. I don't like, I, 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 I'm kind of losing sight of what he's proven and shown to me before. That does not mean that his record changed just because your eyesight changed, just just because your perspective change did not change his flawless record. So what this means is that you shouldn't be getting to, if you're not already there, you should be getting to the place where when something happens in your life, you can literally laugh in the face of it. <clears throat> And I'm not going to say every day that throughout the process that I was laughing at it and like, oh, this is nothing because some days it did try to consume me. But for the most part, I had to remember that God's record is flawless and that even when I couldn't remember it, I was surrounded by people who could remember for me, right? Surrounded by people who could remind me like, don't forget what he's already done. Don't forget that you know his flawless record for yourself. So don't be distracted by these trivial things and the things that are happening around you that are really just trying to get you consumed in your emotions. Find joy in the things that cause you pain because you know that it's producing something. Every time you have gone through something, it has produced something. And one thing that I always tell people is that if you're still going through it, it's probably because you haven't gotten the lesson that God needs you to learn. Listen, I've done this enough times that whenever something is causing me some pain or I'm feeling like some sort of suffering is happening, the first thing that I do is I say, you know what? Let's buckle down. God, what is the lesson that you are trying to show me in this? What is the lesson that in the message that you're trying to get to me? Because I'm not going to hold myself in this place unnecessarily and for an extended period of time for longer than I need to keep myself in this place because I'm so caught up in my emotion that I can't focus on the lesson that I am supposed to get. So Romans chapter 5 Verse three reminds us again, we rejoice in our sufferings. When you are a child of God, you know that all things are working together for your good, that God causes them to work together for your good. So that little distraction, you can't even get caught up in that. You can't be worried about it because it's you gotta know that you know that God is going to make that thing work for your good. The worst possible situation that God is gonna make it work for your good. I was talking to my grandmother yesterday and she told me three stories and one of the stories, the stuck out to me the most. She works um, in addiction recovery and addiction services. She has pretty much all of my life. Um, and she's also an ordained minister and uh, she has a lot of accomplishments, right? Needless to say. So we were talking about, she was telling me three of her favorite uh, testimonies from the people who she has worked with. But the one that stuck out to me is a guy who was a drug dealer for his entire life to the point that he just started earning a legal paycheck like within the past couple of years. And guess what he's earning a legal paycheck doing? Traveling around the world, speaking to audiences about how we can um, uh, get rid of drugs in our community, how it is that we can overcome um, addiction, the types of recovery services that we need to, to have in place in our communities. 
So the man who used to sell drugs to the same communities that he is now trying to help, God took that experience. He spent all of his life, and he's an older gentleman, all of his life, all of his life selling drugs and just started earning a legal paycheck doing what? Helping people to overcome the very thing that he was enabling them to do for his entire life. And guess what? He's getting paid to do it. How are you doing somebody? Okay. So this is why we cannot discount even the worst moments in our life. Somebody would hear that and think, you know, that's deplorable. He was tearing down families and communities and all of that. But that same man that was helping to aid in tearing down communities is the same one that is traveling around the world, helping to restore them based on his own experience, based on firsthand knowledge that you can only get from being in a trap. Okay. And that's just what it is. The, the only the kind of experience that you can get from really being in the gutter. So wherever your bottom place is, wherever that hard place is for you, there is an experience that you can only learn from being in that place that is then going to help you and help you to help others, okay? So let's jump back into our text, Romans chapter five, verse three. Thank you all for all of the love and the hearts that you're sending up. Uh, so again, we find joy in our sufferings because we know that we know that our sufferings produce they produce something. What do they produce? Our suffering produces perseverance. That is the ability to stand firm. That now that you stood firm through this situation, the next time that something happens, you won't be moved by that one either. Because you're going to say to yourself, you know what? I made it through the last situation, so I'm not going to allow this time to overtake me either. That's perseverance. That is steadfastness, being able to stand firm. And then that perseverance builds and produces character. That you, uh, so this is the thing, right? Let's say, and this is a great example. Let's say that you have a financial challenge, right? That um, you have, and I mean, y'all, I listen, I'm gonna say that for another broadcast. I was about to be too real with y'all. Matter of fact, I'm gonna put this in my newsletter. If you are on the newsletter, you're gonna get it today. And I'm gonna tell y'all what I was about to say just now. But what I will say publicly is that you must operate with integrity at all times. It is very, very easy easy when you are going through challenging situations to feel your integrity being tested. That does not mean that you give into it. That does not mean that you say, you know what, I'm going to just do whatever I want to do and I'm going to get this the quick and easy way. No, because as you stand still and as you stand on God's promises, it produces something in you that only allows you to act a certain way. You can't do everything that you want to do. You can't go out there and get it the same way that everybody else gets it. You can't sell your soul to the devil in order to climb the ladder faster. You can't give your body away in order to climb the corporate ladder and that's for men and women. You cannot do things that sacrifice God's calling or rather compromise God's calling on your life and make you a bad representation of what he is doing in your life, okay? Because this produces character. It tells you, it, it helps you to speak to yourself to say, you know what? if I have the ability to stand with God, I'm going to stand back and watch him do what he does. I'm going to trust him throughout the entire process so much to the point that even when it looks a little shaky and a little scary and it begins to get a little tricky, I am not going to move. I'm not going to try to jump ahead of God and do things my way and in my timing so that I can get to the end result faster. Okay, so perseverance produces character and character produces hope that when you get to the point where you are just so steadfast and it's boosting who you are as a person, you are not compromising your integrity. You put everything on God. Let y'all listen. Let me tell you something. I tell y'all me and God's conversations all the time, right? I share little tidbits with y'all all the time. The way that I was like looking at Jesus throughout this home buying process, like, sir, mm -mm, this is what you told me. You just better have a plan. Listen, that's your job to figure it out. I'm going to go over here and do my job. These were the constant conversations that I was having with God. And it wasn't to remind him of who he is, but to remind me of who he is. To remind me that my job is over here doing the things that he told me to do and let him do his job and mind his business. I'm going to stay over here and I'm going to mind my business, right? I'm going to play my part in the process so that we can be co-participators in the bigger vision that God has for my life, okay? So the thing is, is that it produces a hope that causes you to be like, I'm not worried about it. 
I'm not going to stress about it. I'm not giving all of my energy and time to it. I'm not, you know, giving all of my emotion to it and allowing it to cripple me and to stifle me, but rather I'm just going to stay focused on my part of the plan, that we are co-participators in executing the plan that God has for our lives. And part of that plan means that we, as a co-participator rather, we have to do one part and allow God to do his part. So it builds a hope that says, I know you're not going to embarrass me. I know you're not going to have me out here looking like a fool. Like, look, y'all, it was so many times where I would literally be in prayer and be like, God, don't play me. Like, literally. And I would literally tell people around me, like, I know God is not going to play me out. That's hope. Now, that may be a little, you know, hood way of saying it, that he's not going to play me out. But that's hope, right? That I know that God is not going to play me. I know that he's not going to tarnish his good name. I know he's not going to have me out here looking like a fool. I know that I'm not going to be embarrassed. Even when things didn't work according to my timeline, and I have to tell that story later. When things didn't work according to my timeline, the most important part is that they were always working according to his timeline, right? So what that meant was that, again, every time something would happen in the process, I would literally just remind myself, God is not going to play me out. So however you need to display and speak your hope into reality is the way that you need to do it. The way that I say it is, I know God would not play me out like that. You did not give me the idea to do this. You did not give me the idea to do that. You didn't give me the idea to, to you know, write the book or start the, uh, the business or go back to school or start the nonprofit organization. In the same way he didn't do give me the vision to play me out, he didn't give you the vision to play you out. He wouldn't give you something that he had no intention of bringing to fruition, okay? So, and then it says uh, in Romans chapter three, to wrap up this particular scripture, and hope does not disappoint us. That's what I was just talking about, right? The, listen, when you put your hope in God, you're not going to be disappointed. Now you put your hope in people, they'll disappoint you every single time. Okay. But when you put your hope in God, you're not going to be disappointed. Things may not go the way that you thought they should in the way, you know, according to your plan, but you have to know that even when that happens, that there must be a greater plan at work. You have to trust that you're being protected from something, that there is something greater that is already happening and in the works, even if you cannot see it yet. Okay, so uh, hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Again, that secret desire that God placed in your life is a desire that he placed there for a reason and it was given to you by him. He would not play you out by not allowing that thing to come to fruition. Okay, so I need, is this helping somebody? I need you guys to be engaged. I see there's a lot of people on here this morning, which is really a blessing. Because like I said, sometimes it's just me and Jesus on here. But if this is helping you, you know, send up the loves, hit the like button, the heart button. Make sure you invite somebody to join you. So I'm going to give you three really quick things um, that will be produced or that help to produce the promise in your life. Amen. I see the, I see the engagement. Okay, so three really quick tips that will help to produce the promise over your life. I'm gonna say it one more time. Three tips that will help to produce the promise over your life or manifest the promise. I like alliteration, so I had everything start with a P, okay? But these are things that you can do on your end. Again, we are co-participators. So I'm talking about what I did on my end. To be quite honest, I don't know what God did on his end. There are some things that I do know because he revealed them to me and I, I was able to see his hand at work during the process, right? But aside from that, like, I, I don't know what God was doing up there in heaven. That's his business and his business only. Okay? I'm trying to bring some light into this camera. All right, y'all, I can't touch the cameras too much. Uh, okay. Okay. All right. So number one, start with sacrifice. I was having a conversation with a business owner yesterday. Uh, she is, you know, pretty well accomplished. She's a six figure earner. Um, so, you know, pretty well to do single woman, not married, no children. Um, so as a single woman making six figures, pretty good lifestyle, right? Um, she, we, we were having this conversation and she was telling me about where she wanted to see her business grow and where she wanted it to go to. And one of the things that I, I told her, I said, I got to tell you something that you probably don't want to hear and it's not going to sit well with you, but this is the truth and I need you to hear it. 
You are not making the sacrifices that are necessary for you to see what you want to see. You're sitting here at this table talking to me about how tired you are, not understanding that tired is the cost that you have to pay sometimes in order to see the kind of results that you want to see. Y'all, let me tell you something. I have not gotten a full night of sleep in probably about six weeks. And I shared with this young lady that during the process of buying a home, there were so many curveballs that happened. One of the biggest curveballs was that initially I was going to do an investment property with someone else. When that plan did not work out, I had to make up the difference because we had saved up this money. That person had their part. I had my part. We were ready to go. Things did not work out again according to our plan, but it worked out according to God's plan. So we had planned to do an investment property together. We were going to get a triplex or a quadruplex. Um, and like, we was about to blow up like child, we about to, you know, you know, get straight out the, straight out the gate with these investment properties. Right? So we had this plan, but that plan did not work out the way that we thought that it would. So what that meant was in order for me to continue forward with the process, I had to then make up the money that they had put into our savings account that we had put together, um, in order to, to, to attend this goal that was thousands of dollars and I needed to make this money very quickly I didn't find out until probably about three months ago that this person was not going to be able to do this venture with me so literally y'all I mean I tried every way I tried finding other partners to do it I like I can't oh my goodness I I tried every way that I could possibly imagine until I finally just accepted that God said it's going to be me and you to do this. If nobody else is around, if you don't have anybody else to support you, I need you to see what I am going to do for you. I need you to see what's going to happen when you completely put this process in my hands, right? So that was the first part. So I had to make thousands of dollars in a short amount of time. And then I found out um, two weeks before before my closing date that I was not going to be getting any closing cost assistance. That's another thousands of dollars. Thousands. Okay. So listen, I just closed on Friday. Two weeks ago was like the week before Christmas, right? <laughs> okay. Um, I haven't slept in about 30 days. I've gotten a little bit of rest, just enough to sustain myself, but I have not had a full night's sleep in well over 30 days. And the thing is, is that I understood the sacrifice. I started the process with sacrifice, right? Sacrifice continued throughout the process. And I'm going to be sharing some of the specific sacrifices that I made. But to the story that I was telling yesterday, I was telling the young woman because she wants to own her business. This is something that we have to get better at. Own the building that houses your business so that nobody can ever come and put you out. That is an important part of the process. And what I have learned during this process through uh, sharing my journey with people who are self-employed is that a lot of people who are self-employed feel like they will not qualify because of how much it takes being self-employed. It's already a hard process. If you're trying to buy a building or buy a home, the process is already hard. But when you're self-employed, it's like 10 times harder, right? There's much more that you have to prove, much more that you have to be able to show. So a a lot of people get discouraged by the thought of the process. They don't even try. So I'm having this conversation with this woman and she's telling me, she's like, you know, I have to rebuild my savings and do all of this and do all of that. And I'm like, listen, let me tell you three, three things that I did. Top three things. Number one, stop getting my nails done. I started painting my own nails. Y'all see my babies is done today though. Listen, I'm so excited about my nails. So stop getting my nails done. That was out the window. Stop getting my hair done. That went out the window. Do, do your own hair at home. Brunches, lunches, birthday celebrations, trips, vacations, all of that stuff. When you are self-employed, and this is the thing that I would, I would say to people and that I would tell, um, especially to my friends and my family who was close to me, it was not a matter of the finances. One of the big things that was really important for me in this process is that it funded itself. So what I was able to do, and I, I'm really Really, really fortunate that I was able to do this is that I was able to earn enough over the past four months that I did not have to touch my income that I had to bring home. So I wasn't living paycheck to paycheck and was still able to save thousands of dollars in a short amount of time. I'll share that full testimony in that story at a later date. But the point is that when you are in the process being self-employed, the bank scrutinizes 
everything. What they're going to look at and say, and, and y'all, if y'all think I, if anybody has ever purchased a property or purchased anything or gotten a loan, be a self-employed, please back me up in this. When I tell you that they will look at your financial statements and they want to know what you're spending your money on. If they see that you're going out to eat at 30, 40, $50 a pop, two, three, and four times a week, they're going to deny you. And you may say, well, I could be making the money. It doesn't matter because they're looking at your spending habits. One of the things about being self-employed, no matter how you want to spend it, is that our income, it fluctuates. That's the nature of business. It has nothing to do with you as a person, but everything to do with business cycles. You could have a steady incline for years and then all of a sudden have a decline. That's called business cycle. So that's what the banks are looking at. They're not looking at you. It's nothing against you as a person, but what they're looking at is that they want to see and know, will you, are you going to give up all these brunches and lunches that you're doing? Where are you spending your money? How much money are you actually bringing home, right? So you have to start with sacrifice. That's that's the name of the game. If you are trying to see the manifestation of any promise that God has given you, start with sacrifice and watch how he honors that. We know that God's word tells us that obedience is greater than sacrifice, but that does not mean the sacrifice is not important. What it means is that you need both. That when God tells you stop spending your money frivolously, that you obey the instruction and make the sacrifice. I'm going to say that again. Obey the instruction and make the sacrifice. Okay? All right. So start with sacrifice. The scripture that I have for that is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. If I can find it in my Bible, Lord. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58 in the NIV reads, Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Listen, y'all, I'm tired, tired. Listen, Saida hit the nail on the head. Thank you. So somebody knows what I'm talking about. So y'all don't think I'm crazy. It's not about how much you make, but how much you keep. And again, this is a whole nother broadcast. The lessons that I learned on the natural side, I could do another broadcast on that. I'm talking about the spiritual lessons that I learned today, right? So again, uh, let nothing move you. Stand firm. Give yourselves fully to what God is doing in your life. If you know that there is a promise that God gave you and you have enough sense to be able to perceive that it's happening, give yourself fully to that. Again, obey the instruction, make the sacrifice, okay? So that you can see in the end that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. When you obey his word and when you make the sacrifice, you have to know that it is not in vain. Again, you have to remind yourself of the hope. I know God is not going to play me out. I know he's not going to play me out. So I'm going to obey the instruction, make the sacrifice and allow him to do the rest. Okay. The second thing is that you need to prepare for what you want. The process of buying a home for me was over two years in the making. The process of buying a home for me started in May 2016 when I made the sacrifice to move from my apartment in uh, Uptown. If you're not from Philly, you don't know where that is. But if you are, you know Uptown. I moved from Uptown to a, a house that I shared with my best friend for two years. So I went from living by myself to having a roommate in order to save money. And I did what I was supposed to do. When I had the conversation with my best friend about moving out, one of the things that she said to me that really stood out and it still stands out to this day is that you did what you were supposed to do while you were here. Like literally, that was the goal. So there was no like, oh, you know, why are you leaving me? Or like any type of, no other emotion except, girl, you did your thing. You did exactly what you set out to do when you made the sacrifice to take on a roommate, move to a part of the city where the parking is horrible, the people is crazy. You made the sacrifice for two years. And for some people that may seem like a long time, but that two years flew by. And at the right time, when it was, when it was finally time, then I was able to start to see the manifestation of the process, but it was based on a decision that was made in May of 2016 and actually before that. 
because I had to put the, the, the things in place to be able to make that move. So if you're saying, you know what, I want to hit the next six figures in my business. I want to open up a storefront. I want to start a new line. I want to start a business. I want to get a promotion. All of these things that you want to achieve and that you want to see at your next level, you have to start preparing for them now. I talked to you all about this and I have been preaching this like it's the gospel that we have to stop limiting ourselves to one year at a time. I knew, and I'll be completely honest with you guys, I wanted to buy my first home in 2017. Again, that was not a part of God's plan. That was my plan, right? God said, mm, nope, you ain't ready. I got, I applied and I actually got denied. So then I had to go back to the drawing board and say, okay, what more do I need to do? So I kept paying down debt, continued to save money, continued to make sacrifices, continue to cut back on the lunches, the brunches and all of that other stuff that slowly drains your money, making the sacrifices that were necessary so that when 2018 hit, even though it was a year behind my timeline, it was the perfect timing. Okay, so what I need you all to do is for whatever you want, you need to begin to prepare for what you want right now. We are preparing for 2020 and 2021 and 2022 at this point now. Don't wait until next year to try to prepare for the following year. Start preparing right now. I have scripture for you. We're going to the book of wisdom. If you don't know what that is, I want you to read your Bible some more. Read it more often, okay? We're going to the Book of Wisdom, chapter 24. Somebody tell me what the Book of Wisdom is. Put it in the caption. Hey, guys. Hey, Mel. Thank you to everybody who's joining. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Book of Wisdom, chapter 24. I'm doing a little Bible quiz with y'all this morning. See how much you knew. Somebody put it in the, uh, the, the comments what book we're going to. Book of Wisdom, chapter 24, verse 27. You saints must not know it. Ain't nobody typing. Book of Wisdom, chapter 24, verse 27 reads in the NIV. Fin yes, Proverbs. Amen. <laughs> All right. <laughs> somebody got it, child. I think somebody had to Google it. Who was Googling? Somebody Googled it. It's all right. Because um, I got a little joke for y'all in a second. Yes, Proverbs. Amen. So Proverbs is the book of wisdom. It was written by the man who is believed to be one of the most wise men in all of biblical history, and that is King Solomon. Okay. All right, so we're going to Proverbs chapter 24, verse 27. And the NIV, it reads, finish your outdoor work. Finish what you start at, okay? Finish your outdoor work, all the stuff that you need to do over there so that when it, when it comes time for what needs to happen right here, you'll be ready, okay? So finish your outdoor work and get your fields ready, if you know that you want to receive a harvest, you have to go out there and sow. That's what this is saying. Put plant all the seeds. Like I told you all, I knew I knew in 2015 that I wanted to buy either 2014 or 2015 that I wanted to buy a house in 2017. OK, so it was a part of like my two or three year plan. I remember this very vividly and I can probably find the affirmation book. I know for a fact I can. I'm a See if I can find it and send it to those of you who are on my mailing list, okay? But I wrote in there that I will buy a home by the end of 2017. That was my goal. And I think I wrote it in 2014, but I'll get the exact date for you, okay? So the thing is, is that I knew though, at least four years ago from now, that I wanted to buy a home. So that means that four years ago, I started planting the seeds first in my thought process. And the way that I think about and look at the promises that God made on my life, that was a desire that he dropped into my heart. At the time, I didn't know very many homeowners. Even to this day, I don't, I can't think of off the top of my head, when I look at my closest friends, how many of them are actually homeowners, right? So the thing is, is that I know that that's a desire that he gave me because I wasn't surrounded by that, Okay. So this was a desire that was planted years ago. So I started planting seeds four, three, two years ago 
so that when I got to the place for the manifestation, the work was already done. And that's what God's word is telling us. Finish your work. Do what you need to do. Plant your seeds. Get your field ready. You can't show up to the field in 2019 and try to collect a harvest that you didn't sow in 2018, 17, 16, 15, and 14. You're trying to reap a benefit that you never sold into. So prepare for what you want. Finish your outdoor work, okay? And get your fields ready after that. Then you can build your house, okay? Finish your outdoor work, get your fields ready, and after that, you can build your house. After that, you can build the business. After that, you can write the book. After that, you can launch the business. I can't tell you how many people try to launch with no preparation. You're just launching just because you're, you want to make money. And let me tell you something, to any person who is an aspiring business owner, if you are going into business to make money, you're starting off on the wrong foot and you are absolutely playing yourself. You do not go into business to make money, but you also don't stay in business by not making money. There's a fine line that you have to walk. It can't be all about the money because what that means is that when the money is not adding up, you're going to give up on the business instead of reinventing yourself. All right. So prepare for the prepare, uh, excuse me, prepare for what you want. All right. Let's move on to the last point that you need to remember. The last lesson that I want to share for today, not the last one that I have. A delay is not a denial. My schedule, my original, original scheduled closing date was December 31st. I was hyped. I was like, oh, at the end of the year, God's going to keep a promise. It's going to be beautiful. And this is going to make for a great testimony, right? I'm like, this is going to be the bomb. Hey, my accountant just hopped on. Hey, accountant. Um, so I was like, you know, this is going to be the bomb. I didn't close until January 4th. But that did not mean anything. And one thing my lender kept telling me, we're going to close, we're going to close, we're going to close. Like she literally kept saying this like every single day, okay? Because at this point, I'm like, listen, I'm ready to tap out. I can go invest this money somewhere else. I got a whole other list of goals that I can accomplish. Like, listen, if this ain't going to work right now, I can move on to the next thing on the list, okay? That's how long my list of goals is. But I had to be reminded that delay is not denial. So there's two scriptures for, uh, for you all. Habakkuk, I got the pronunciation right today because y'all know I'm usually butchering that. Um, Habakkuk chapter two, uh, verse three. And for those of you who don't know where that is, it's at the end of the Old Testament portion of the Bible. One of the last books of the Old Testament. <clears throat> Hopefully I can find it. And it's only three chapters long, so it's just a couple of pages, which makes it very challenging to find. There we go. Okay. Habakkuk, <clears throat> verse two, I'm, ch I'm sorry, chapter two, verse three. It reads in the NIV, for the revelation awaits an appointed time. The promise is awaiting the appointed time. It speaks of the end of, not where you currently are, but where you are going. And it will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it, it will certainly come and will not delay. What I want to do uh, this morning for the sake of teaching is that I want to change the word it to God. Okay, so let's change it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. God speaks of the end. So when we are listening to God speak, when he drops things into our spirit, and I've talked about this before, just because he told you something today does not mean that it's meant to be manifested tomorrow. We do that to ourselves again. And when we only plan for a year at a time, we are playing ourselves, first of all, we're limiting ourselves and limiting what we believe is possible for God to achieve. That you are confining him to your limited view on time. Like I said, I wrote about the promise of wanting to be a homeowner back in like 2014 or 2015. I knew when God dropped it in my spirit that it wasn't the time for it. I was like, there ain't no way this is the time for it. 
I got so many other things I need to get in order. So I started the work. Okay. So let's keep inserting the word God. Um, God speaks of the end and will not prove false. God will not lie to you. He's not going to play you out. He's not going to have you out here talking, you know, proclaiming his goodness and then not do it. Okay. So, uh, God speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though God lingers, wait for God. <laughs> I wanted to insert the word God because I knew that we needed to make this real for some people. If you are like me, there are some times where I feel like God is just lingering, child. Like he must be hanging out doing something else. He can't possibly have his attention on me right now because he's lingering. We've been waiting. Like, what you doing, Lord? Okay? It might not be you, but it's me. I'm going to be honest with y'all, okay? Therefore, as much faith as I have, sometimes I really be looking like, um, hello, you who over here. Hey, God, it's me. You there? Like that, sometimes it gets like that, okay? So though, uh, though God lingers, wait for God, okay? So the back end of that is wait on his timing. Don't try to jump ahead or rush ahead of him. Don't try to move ahead of him and do your own thing. That's never going to work. Okay? So though he may linger in your mind, wait for him because it is better to wait for him than it is to try to run and jump ahead of him. God will certainly come and will not delay. So I want you all to make this an affirmation for this year. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I want you all to make this an affirmation. Um, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3 I want you to take out the word it, do it from the NIV version so that we all have the same affirmation, please. So, and I'll, I'll type this, I'll put it on um, Facebook and I'll also put it in the newsletter too. But change the word it to God and I want you to proclaim this over your life every single day for 2019, okay? For the rest of the year, every single day, proclaim this over your life. Start your day with this, okay? All right, and then the next, the next and final scripture that I want to share with you is a Second Peter chapter three verse nine. That's in the NIV. It's all the way in the back, almost at the end. It's a little book, little bitty book. Second Peter chapter three verse nine. It's actually only three chapters long. Second Peter chapter three verse nine in the NIV reads. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness, right? Again, there have been times where I have felt like God was just taking his sweet little precious time and, you know, wasn't in no kind of hurry to move when I wanted him to move. But again, that's how we in our, our finite minds and our limited view of things, that's how we perceive time. God is not slow. He's actually moving very quickly. And if anybody knows how God really moves, when you get in alignment with God, like for real, for real, it does not take him long to move. It does not take him long to do what he said that he was going to do. Okay. But you have to be obedient, obey the instruction, make the sacrifice. Remember that. Obey the instruction, make the sacrifice. So the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness. He is patient with you. He's waiting on, listen, you are not waiting on God. He's waiting on you to finally be completely obedient and fully surrendered. You think that you're waiting on God and God is like, no, I'm waiting on you. Yes, I'll repeat them. You're waiting, thinking like, oh God, I'm waiting on you to show up. No, he's waiting on you to act right. How about that? He's waiting on you to act right. To follow his instruction, to be obedient. Okay. Uh, so he's not slow as some understand slowness. He's patient with you because he loves you and he doesn't want to move ahead of you. The audacity that we have, thank you, Holy Spirit. We have such an audacity and such a cockiness and arrogance about us that we would be so bold as to move ahead of God, but he never moves ahead of us. In the sense that, yes, he's planned out the future, but in the sense that he doesn't leave you in your mess. What if God said, you know what? I'm gonna move on without you. So let me change that. Our arrogance causes us to move on without God and God doesn't move on without us. Yes, he moves ahead of us, but he does not move on without us. 
But we're so cocky and so arrogant and so full of ourselves that we like, oh, God's taking too long, so I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to move on without God. I'm going to go ahead and do what I want to do. How arrogant and disrespectful and heartbreaking is that to God? That he waited on you and he's been waiting on some of y'all for years, decades, your whole life, right? That he's waited on you, but you won't wait on him. He's patient with you and he doesn't move on without you and say, you know what? Since you didn't want to do it, I'm going to just go ahead and move on. You didn't want to be obedient, so fine. Just stay back there and stay in your sin, stay in hell, and I'm going to just leave you there. No. So if he doesn't do it to you, you need to develop more patience with him. The same measure of patience that God has with you is the same measure of patience that you need to have with him. Okay? Um, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish. He doesn't want you to die in your mess and in your sin and in your heartbreak and in your disappointment. Okay? He doesn't want you to perish, but he wants everyone to come to repentance. He wants you to come to the point, and this is what repentance is, another teaching moment for those of you who do not know it. A lot of times we think that repentance is only, oh, I have to ask God for forgiveness for my sins. No, that's just asking God for forgiveness. That's what that is. Repentance is a deeper work and an action that happens. It's not just saying, God, forgive me, but it's an action. It's a, a decision that you make to say, I am going to to choose to turn away from what is not of God and to turn toward what is God, okay? So repentance is an action. And that's what God wants you to come to the point of making a decision to choose him in his way. That's why he's waiting. He's waiting for you to make a decision. You're not waiting for him to decide if he wants to manifest the promise. He's waiting on you to decide that you really want it. And that you want it his way and not your way. Okay? So again, uh, he is patient with you. He does not want you to die in your mess. But he wants everyone to come to the point of repentance. Everyone to come to the point of saying, you know what, God? I'm turning away from doing it my way. And I'm making a decision to do a 180 and turn toward you. Follow your will, your way, your plan. Okay? So that's it. That's all I got. Um, I am going to recap really quickly. Okay. So the scriptures that we had for today, uh, Romans chapter five, verses three through five, first Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Proverbs 24, verse 27. And for some of us today, we learned that that's the book of wisdom. Anytime you need some wisdom and you need to know how to handle something, go to the book of Proverbs. Just start reading. Because it's literally like the same things that repeat themselves over and over and over. Okay. Um, Habakkuk, I got it right this time, y'all. Chapter 2, verse 3. And then 2 Peter, verse 3. And uh, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 9. The affirmation that I want you all to come up with, like I said, I will um, post it on Facebook. And I will also send it to those of you who are on the mailing list. Um. It come, the one that we came up with for today is, uh, it came from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. And we're going to make it say, let's, uh, let's do, for the promise awaits an appointed time. God speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though God may linger, wait for him. God will certainly come and will not delay. Okay. All right. So, um, we, I'm going to go ahead and pray out. If you have any questions, Instagram is getting ready to cut off. So I'm going to go ahead and pray out. If you have any questions, please, please, please put it in the comment box, uh, right now so that I can answer them very quickly. And then we can go ahead and get you guys on your way. Uh, Lord, before we come to you, once again, just asking for anything, we just want to say thank you, God. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for all that you poured out. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. God, we thank you for every person who has watched this broadcast and every person who will watch the replay. Father God, we thank you for how it is that your hand is over our lives, how you are still in control and you are still seated on the throne. Father God, we make a choice today to turn away from choosing our way and the way that we 
wants to do things and turning toward you. God, we bless you for your love and your compassion so much so that you wait for us because you don't want us to die in our mess, but rather you want us to see the manifestation of the promises that you made to us. Father God, I pray that your people would remain steadfast, that they would remain hopeful, Father God, and that you would continue to build their character, that they would remain firmly planted and rooted in you so that you get all the glory out of everything that happens in their lives. God, we pray that you would cause all things to work for their good, Father God, and that you would cause it to work for your glory, God. We don't want anything that does not bring you glory in the name of Jesus. Nothing, God, that does not bring you glory and shine a light on your goodness and on your love and on your truth. God, we ask that you would just bless this week, that this week would be a, a week of abundant miracles and blessings, overflow and increase so much so, Father God, that your people are just in awe of you, that they just stand in amazement of the wonderful things that you are doing in this time, God. God, we ask these in all things in your name. Amen. All right.